Well, hello, fellow ag nerd. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the Future of Agriculture podcast. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you're interested in where innovative ideas meet practical realities in food production, you found the right show. We often talk about digital tools on this podcast and their relevance to the future of agriculture. But one key piece that I think often gets overlooked here is that the most likely customer for a lot of these digital tools may not actually be a farmer. For many of them, an advisor to that farmer may actually be the one performing the task that it aims to help optimize and may have the biggest vested interest in adopting cutting edge technologies. I use the example of plumbing technology. You know, don't try to sell it to me as a homeowner, sell it to my plumber. That's what I pay them to do. I see a lot of ag technology offerings as sort of the same way, especially as fewer farmers cover more ground, the reliance on these trusted advisors becomes even more critical. Now, you may have heard the narrative that through things like e-commerce and overall digitization of ag, that local retailer or local advisor becomes less relevant. And I actually don't really believe that to be true. Like everything, there's a lot of nuance here, but overall, I think the role will change, but be no less important than it has been in the past. For that reason, I wanted to profile some of those advisors, the agronomists, ag retailers, consultants, and other local professionals that farmers rely on for guidance, advice, and implementation. I want to learn more about how they are utilizing technology to serve those farmer customers. I'm calling this little mini-series The Tech-Enabled Advisor, and I'm happy to be sharing these stories with you occasionally over the next few months, starting with today's episode with Matt Larson, who's an agronomy sales manager for CHS in Holdridge, Nebraska. Now, to help me identify the right tech-savvy advisors for these episodes and to make sure that we hear from different types of guests throughout the series, I've asked various ag tech companies to partner with me on these episodes. The first one to say yes is the sponsor of today's episode, Field Agent by Centera. Now, if you're not familiar, Field Agent enables agronomic advisors to make more timely decisions by taking data they're already using on a daily basis, like satellite, weather, equipment, soil, field operations, etc., and integrating it with drone data and Centera's machine learning capabilities. This allows advisors to engage with growers when and where they want to be engaged and have data-driven management conversations right on their own agronomic platform. Thanks, Centera, for sponsoring this show and for introducing me to today's guest, Matt Larson. As I mentioned, Matt is the agronomy sales manager for CHS in Holdridge, Nebraska. CHS, you probably know, is a leading global agribusiness owned by farmers, ranchers, and cooperatives across the United States. Matt grew up on a farm just about six miles away from where he works now and has been with the company for about 12 years. He manages a six-person team that serves farmers in south-central Nebraska and north-central Kansas. Matt and his team utilize technology like Field Agent, along with Climate Field View and CHS's Agellum, to service their farmer customers who are mostly irrigated row crop farmers as well as some dryland wheat. Great conversation here about the changes happening at the farm level between farmer and advisor, how advisors like Matt are utilizing technology to serve these customers, and how data is actually helping them build trust and closer relationships with farmers. Matt starts off by talking about how competitive that ag retail landscape is in his area and what him and his team are doing to differentiate their offerings. You know, the biggest thing that we got to do to separate ourselves is bring new ideas. You know, everybody has a fertilizer price. Everybody sells a seed of some kind or a chemical of some kind. The big thing that we need to do is separate ourselves with technology being a big one, service, information to growers, and just being able to offer those different ideas that maybe somebody else hasn't quite caught on to yet. The little bit of time that we get in front of a grower, we have to maximize it. It's not the old days where you show up on the farm and you get an hour to talk and find out about their whole operation and they don't have time for that anymore. So when we show up at a farm, we have to have our ducks in a row. We have to have good information and we need to be efficient about it. And did that change happen during your career? I mean, can you think back and say when you started, it felt like you could go and just kind of shoot the breeze for hours and hang out and ride around, but something changed. And I'm curious if that happened during your career and, and what you think maybe changed that. It's absolutely changed. Technology has been the big thing that's changed it. So when I first started out, you know, they kind of gave you a grower list or gave you some current customers of the co-op and they said, you know, 
go make contact with them and build that relationship. And while that today is still very, very important, I did everything via phone, not very much email, you know, when I first started, even 12 years ago. And today it's a lot of text message communication, a little bit of email, communicate a little bit on social media, Twitter. And ironically, or weirdly enough, I communicate with some of my growers on like Snapchat. So they send me a picture, I can just answer right away. And it's just changed a lot. And it's something that I wouldn't have thought of 12 years ago. So yeah, it is crazy. And I mean, other than, you know, not having as much sort of in-person time and, and some of that conversation moving to digital, you know, what else does that change about the way you need to approach, you know, your work? Does it change at all other than being on all these platforms? You know, Snapchat, I'm kind of surprised to hear. I, I'm not <laughs> on Snapchat, so that would be a big leap for me if I was going to go do that. I guess what else has changed other than the platforms? You know, the the big thing is just how you present data or information to a grower there's a selling season for everything or or a time that we go out and pitch an idea or new things to a grower. It's a results first industry. Now they want to know, okay, where have you tried it? How local is it? Where's the hard data? And where does that come from? A lot of that stuff today is driven from these platforms. CHS is a gel the climate. We use a lot of climate and now field agent. We kind of incorporate all those things. So when we, when we bring information to a grower, it's all there and we can send them an email. We can upload stuff to their tractors, any of that stuff. And then they can track it throughout the year. The old days of, Hey, try this product and take it out of the back of my pickup and dump it in their planner and then throw a flag. And then we meet it at the end of the year and find the flag and then harvest it. And then talk about that data. Those days are kind of gone. So that's the biggest change is just using those platforms efficiently. Okay. And we've talked about FieldView some on, on this program. So regular listeners will be familiar with FieldView, but I don't think we've talked at all about CHS's platform. You said it's called Agellum. Is that right? Yep. It's Agellum. Agellum is an all-encompassing way to just store all this data we get. Your climate information can come right to it. If you're on John Deere or Case Equipment, those as applied maps can come straight into it. And one thing that our growers really like is when CHS is out doing custom application of something, those as applied go right into it. So the grower kind of has a one-stop shop to see all that stuff. It also has a farm planning tool that the grower themselves or the sales guy such as I could sit down and put together a whole farm plan from an expense standpoint. Um, What are my costs? Where do I need to cut? What do I got to look at? It could be as little as what are they just buying for me? And is in depth is here's my rent, here's my splits my personal living expense, all that stuff, prints out a great PDF that they can bring to their banker. We can then transform that into some crop plans. So the grower and us or their independent agronomist all is on the same page. And then the other aspects of it as we go through the season and where it kind of ties into this other data a little bit, Tim, is Ogellum allows us to go out and gather data, such as stuff from field agent and that kind of stuff. And it has a scouting app. So there's an iPad Um, There's an app for it. So we can go out to the farm and our sales guys can scout, take pictures and send it directly to the grower at his house. You know, five o'clock in the evening, this needs sprayed tomorrow. Here's some pictures. Here's what I saw. Send it to them and they have that information instantly. And then when there's issues, we can do things to help discover where those issues. And that's where some of the climate and the, the field agent stuff come in as well. Okay, great. You know, generally speaking, who are the customers that say, I'll come to you when I need XYZ product? Other than that, I just want to keep everything to myself versus the customers like, wait a minute, if I just give you access to the data, you're going to give me something I can just spit out and take to my banker. That sounds great. You know, where on that spectrum are most growers and what are you noticing about the similarities or differences between them? The first thing that keys on your question is in today's world, especially here in South Central Nebraska, growers do not come to us anymore. They all want it done on their farm. We meet with them or we send them information. They they want that stuff brought to them. There might be some time in the off season that they might come in, but I do not want my sales staff sitting in the offices because they do not come. That's a big thing that's changed in the years. Cause I remember growing up, going to the co-op with my dad, you know, and we'd go sell some grain and then we'd go across the aisle and then go lock in this fertilizer. And uh, it's just not like that anymore. But these growers, I mean, especially when it comes financially, the crop plan part of a gelum, that stuff is safe. It stays within the platform. We do not share it. I do let the growers know if they put an input in there, you know, a rent cost, that is something that I can see. So I do have some growers that, that input that information 
use it, print it out, and then they delete it. It's not saved. But a lot of the growers just use it for an input, you know, the stuff that they're comfortable with me knowing. That's where they're using a lot of that information. And I would say the more progressive growers, they're more interested in the data piece of it, the ag data, the results, than they are the financial farm planning. But it, it comes in all shapes and sizes for sure. Hmm. You need to start serving some better coffee to bring more farmers in. I know. I know it. I know it. We're all kind of craving that a little bit after COVID. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, of these customers, it sounds like they're all generally pretty data driven. They really do care about the data. So I imagine the vast majority of them, are they using some sort of precision agriculture and, and sort of kind of where does CHS come into play with that? Yep. So I would say, just throwing a number out there, I would say way north of 75% of our growers, especially the ones that are, you know, continuing to grow and, and not towards their end of their career are all using precision data of some kind. I would say the, the driving force in our area is definitely climate field view. And then there's a lot of green equipment in our area. So there's a lot of John Deere link in that service as well. So that's what's really nice. And that's what we like about our Agellum platform is they all speak to each other. And I think that's the big struggle we have. And you talked about earlier what we need to do to separate ourselves. Growers have all this data. They have the planting data. They have the seedling data, harvest data. They're spraying all that stuff. What do they do with it? And that's where I think it's part of our job to kind of dig through the weeds and find out what's the real and what's the fake for them. You know, what makes a difference and then bring that to them. That's what I want to use all these platforms for to just make sure that we're bringing them the data that only matters to their farm that's going to impact them financially. And that's how we're going to succeed with our growers. Is part of the problem with it, obviously what you said, like finding out what actually is making a difference and what is just noise, but also is part of the problem how easy it is to get that you know data from the field to you. To me, that's the big thing with the field view is all of a sudden it made data collection easy, right? And so is that kind of the challenge? And what does that look like when you're like, okay, if you want to get this data on our platform, here's what I need from you. What does that look like for them to do that? So Agellum has really easy API connections. They basically go into their climate account and they click a button and they're okay with it once I send them an invite and we can connect those instantaneously. And I would say a huge number of growers are comfortable with that. I haven't been told no. You know, I think when they're dealing with somebody at the local level, I think they're comfortable sharing that stuff for sure. And the field agent piece is coming with it too. I mean, they're all just one click. You know, I can one click with the grower's permission, obviously, connect to their John Deere link and connect to their Raven software, one click, do their climate. And it's, it's a pretty easy, quick thing. And it seems like I, I make that one click and I show up the next day and it's all there. So, yeah, they're pretty comfortable with it. No, that's great. And maybe introduce us to Field Agent. You know, when did this first come on your radar and what problem does that solve for you? So we did a pilot program with them last year and we kind of went into it not knowing. So just a few examples. So if you go back to before Field Agent, I'm going to start at planning time. So the corn gets to V2, V3 stage. Part of our service to our growers is I would send myself and my, my sales people would go out and we'd go to every grower's quarter and we would do four or five yield checks. We'd drive the field with our four-wheeler. We'd go out there with a the tape measure and do stand counts and make sure that things are the way they need to be. The products that we sell them are working. Fast forward to today, the first part of Field Agent is it is a drone-driven system that takes imagery and brings that data back to a platform that can actually tell us what the stand counts are in a field. So when I go out and I send my team out to fly this drone, about 20 minutes, they can fly a quarter, download the information, and I get a report of a full quarter with data sets throughout the whole quarter telling me what the stand counts are. Now, if there's a piece of that field, let's say the Southeast 40, you know, if we dropped a population here in South Central Nebraska, 34,000, and there was a part of that field that was coming in 20, 25, or 22,000, we would know instead of spending our time doing random five spots in the field, we would go to that place where there's an issue, do two or three stand counts, true that up, which doing that last year, they're scary accurate. And then we'd go to a better part of the field, you know, and do one and make sure. And then we can have that conversation with our grower. So it's more efficient with our time. We're, we're spending less time guessing and bringing them five points and more time bringing them not only a, 
a map that shows them what their stand counts are throughout the farm, but then also where are the trouble spots, if there are any, and solutions. And if a field is flown at 10 a.m., I could legitimately go out there and chew those up and have that conversation with that grower by noon. And that's a pretty darn quick turnaround. And some of the things I've seen with technology in the past is we've relied on outside sources or somebody else flying an airplane. They might, you know, they fly it every couple of weeks. We get a data dump, you know, and then a week's gone by and then we go out and look at it and, you know, it could be anywhere from three to seven to 10 days before we get the information. And this is just instantaneous. So that's the first piece of the field agent I really like. The second piece is it does have the satellite imagery to it. So we can look at the satellite imagery and look at crop vigor throughout the growing season and see if there's any issues there. And if there is an issue, we'd go out and check on it and then report back to the grower. We'd use our our scouting service through a Agellum, make a good report, take some pictures of the issue and bring it back to them. My favorite part of this field agent is the tassel counts. When we go late season and those tassels are emerged and we can go out there and fly a field and we get the same report back that says, you know, what the tassel counts are instead of a stand count. They're very, very accurate. But on the computer, I can sit down with that grower and I can click on a section of that field and I can see the corn standing there. You can zoom all the way in to see where they're picking up the tassel counts, what the issues are, all that stuff. And I just absolutely love that piece of it. And we can do the same thing on the stand counts early. You know, we can click on it and zoom in and physically look at the corn that the drone's counting. It's neat. That is cool. And so let's take both examples, the stand count and the tassel count. What's the strategy? So you sit down and talk to the grower. You flew it at 10. You trued it by noon. You're talking to the grower over lunch. How's that conversation go? Well, the first thing is, is obviously in a perfect conversation, the, the stand counts are all good. And... He knows that the product that we sold him came out of the ground like it should, and his planner was set right, and that's just one concern off his plate. Now, if there is an issue, you know, because when you're doing stand counts, was it a planner issue? Was it a depth issue? Single row? Was it the width of the planner? Or was it a product issue with the seed? Or do we have an insect issue? With that data, you're not going out there to him and saying that West 80 might need attention. You can actually go and say, okay, these 15 acres... You don't need to spend time or money on the other part, but here's the information from these 15 acres that are an issue. Here's what your limitations are, and they can go out and address that. And that's the big thing about the early stand counts is just, you know, do we need to go replant? Is it too late to replant? Do we need to do a different product? All that stuff, timing becomes very, very important. The tassel counts, there's a lot of different things I use that for. First thing is we go and fly the crop. And like I told you earlier that we do a lot of fertilizer through the pivots here. So our growers are fertilizing for, depending on who they are, 240, 250, 270 bushel corn. And if we go out and fly that field and the stand's not there or they have some issues, you know, if we planted 34,000 and some natural things happen throughout the year and we're down to 24,000 final stand, let's just save the money on that fertilizer application. You know, you're Your yield goal of 260 bushels isn't there anymore. Let's take the $20 that we were going to put in fertilizer. Let's put it on another field. That's one thing I really like about is managing inputs. The second thing, I guess you'd call it lucky, unlucky for us. We had a huge wind event through South Central Nebraska last year, you know, 10% to 90% green snap. So we had already went and flown a bunch of fields and knew what those stand counts were. And this wind event kind of changed the whole thing. It made all that data we collected just overnight within an hour, it wasn't worth anything anymore. And we were able to go out and fly these acres and a grower, you know, especially where it's their field, they're very emotional about their corn. You know, they're driving around and they see a bunch of green snap, you know, they don't really know. They call the insurance agent and they say they can see where it's worse or, you know, we can fly that quarter and we know exactly where's the worst, what numbers were affected, corn hybrid varieties, you know, And the second thing that I found really interesting last year is I overlaid some two and a half acre grid samples from a gelum over with the tassel counts and the breakage that we saw and found in a lot of cases, it was nutrient driven where they're the worst part of the fields or maybe their dad 20 years ago moved a bunch of dirt. That's where the green snap was. And it was really interesting overlaying all this data to give the grower those answers. And that was just a completely different way of servicing a product that I've never had before. It was a lot of fun. 
Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and one maybe that we gloss over too often, which is for you, all relationships are built on trust and the ability to bring this data to the farmer at a time that they need it, even if it's not like, oh, we gave them this information and we sold more inputs. Like, it's building that trust because you have access to that data. Yep. You know, and I just go back three or four years ago, we had a really bad wooden event and a great corn hybrid just took it in the shorts and nobody ever bought it again. This year, there was some trends with some hybrids. We went out with this drone and brought the data to the grower and told the story. And then we flew their other fields that weren't affected as much. It could have been planting direction. It could have just been area. It could have been fertility. And we could show that grower is, you know, yes, there's some risk. Obviously, we just learned with this product. But now let's in the future, let's make sure that we put this product on the right ground. You know, and oh, by the way, we already have your two and a half acre grids. We know what the soils are. We know that stuff with the other technology that we offer and we can have that conversation and it's completely different. Nice. Well, I mean, imagery is is something that, you know, it could be hard, especially in, I guess I'll call the imagery sphere to like differentiate those products one from the other. What was it about this one that caught your attention? When companies brought us new stuff, we were kind of imageried to death, if that's a word. You know, everybody had a different imagery. Everybody had something, use this, here's your satellite imagery and fly this with an airplane and we'll get you imagery. The two main things that I liked about Field Agent is one, it's controlled by us. So we're trained, our team knows how to use it. If a grower calls and says, hey, I got an issue, we can drive out there and do it right away. That's the number one thing. The other thing is I'm not, and this could be wrong and I know this drives people crazy. I'm not a big fan of pretty maps. You know, all farmers say, it. here's all these colors and all these different things. What do they really mean? The grower always asks, green, so that's good, so I don't have to worry about that. Or red, oh my gosh, what's going on? I don't like that. The thing that I like about this technology is, yes, we get the pretty maps, but there's numbers tied to it, and they're true numbers. You know, when we go out, and I did it last year a number of times that I got a report from a grower, and they felt that their stands were good at the end of the year. Let's go with it, right? And so just for fun, I went out and flew the drone and stands were off like 10%. And I was really nervous because I had another kid fly the drone for me. I was really nervous to go out to this grower and tell him, you know, you're wrong and you're independent agronomist. I don't really agree with that. So I went out there in a lot of spots and I counted ears and I did this whole thing. And sure as heck is it was right. And we were able to go out there and, and save that money to the grower. I wasn't selling them the seed, but I was selling them the fertilizer. So I went out there and brought this technology to the grower and cut my sales to help benefit him. But it just deepened that relationship. That's the big thing. Hmm. Well, I'm sure you, you've heard the cynicism from people who say, oh, well, you know, ag retail, you're just there to sell product. And so, you know, you find any way to sell more product. And, you know, a lot of the technology that you are adopting is trying to become more efficient, which is probably going to lead to, you know, less product being sold. How do you think about that? And, you know, how do you communicate with your sales team about that? The number one thing that we always tell our sales team is, I mean, if we go out and sell a grower on something they don't need, We'll get that sale that one year, but everybody on my staff's local. I'm local. We need to work with that grower for the rest of our careers, at least, you know, so we need to do things and we need to be responsible for those things that we sell. So that's very important to all of us. We're all local. That's what's fun with us is, and especially with all this technology is we can bring this stuff and we can kind of see the farm grow. You know, I got growers that I worked with. You know, going back for a lot of this new stuff started coming out and we were planting, you know, the good hybrids at the time and we didn't have a great program or plan put together. And we incorporated a gelum and started doing two and a half acre grids. They get climate, you know, they can track their hybrids through there. We can talk through stuff, you know, and now last year we're flying it with the drone and they come in in the off season after harvest and we talk about yield data. And when I'm having that yield data conversation with those growers, I have a monitor and I pulled up the drone data from field agent. On one monitor, I had the field agent. One monitor, I had our agellum with their soil samples. And then the other one with their with their yield results. And that's a conversation that just can't be replicated, I don't think. Before field agent, did you have a way to get easy and accurate stand count and tassel counts? No. We would sometime use satellite imagery. 
But, you know, as those are flown or that stuff comes weekly or biweekly, it's out to date already. And so once the corn gets to V2, V3, we just drive out there with a four-wheeler and 160 acres and pick five spots, you know, maybe one from every 40 acres and somewhere extra and, and do a stand count. There was no real science or math to it. As the corn gets a little bit stronger and we can start to see some bigger issues on satellite imagery, we might key in on something there. But obviously at that point, the replanting options off the table. So it was very reactive for sure. And a lot of shots in the dark. That makes sense. To shift gears a little bit, you know, you have a staff of six people, you know, hopefully they're great and they're around forever, but inevitably you have to train someone. And I would think the training you have to do now is probably more robust than the training you went through when you started with all of the tools and the data and the new way of doing things. How do we train the next generation of sort of tech enabled advisors here? The big thing is getting advisors to lean on the different forms of communication. If I bring in somebody that's very techie, they might not have great personal skills to go out and, and build conversation with the grower. I also might have somebody that's a great agronomist that knows the active ingredients, knows fertilizer, what the grower needs to do, but is completely lost when it comes to oh my gosh, what's a jellum or really I'm going to go fly a drone. You know, it's kind of a melting pot and I don't think there's ever one answer for anything. These kids coming out of college, they got a little bit of both worlds, right? They've grown up in technology. They kind of understand it a little bit. So we really have to hammer on, let's know the technology, but we can't go sell anything and spray the wrong herbicide or we're in deep trouble, or we can't short the guy nitrogen in his 250 bushel corn crop or we're in deep trouble. So let's cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's there and let's keep using this stuff. But we have to make sure that you go check it, you know, and that's a big thing that I like about these drones is it gives us information and then we can go put our eyes on it and check it. I don't want anybody managing a field from sitting in their office here all day long. You know, that doesn't work. So we just need to blend the two together. Talk a little bit more about why that doesn't work. No matter how good it is. Technology will fail you at some point a little bit, but we can't be making chemistry recommendations and fertilizer recommendations and explaining to a grower what they need to do without going out and seeing and touching the crop. One thing I really like about flying the drone is give or take, it takes about 20 minutes. You draw a path for it, you tell it what to do, and then you throw it up in the air and you need to keep an eye on it, but you got 20 minutes. So you can go and, and do some things. You can go touch and feel the crop. What stage is it in? Is there weeds coming? Any of that stuff. Flying the drone does not get us out of the field. We're still in the field, and that's what counts. Our goal with our sales staff is we do a lot of custom application in chemistry, and we're putting a lot of stuff in the tank. And there's a lot of technologies being planted out here. So we still have to go and make sure that that technology is planted what the neighbors have planted, where the trees are, where the gardens are, all that stuff. So it just doesn't work sitting in the office. Right. Well, you mentioned earlier, CHS is a one-stop shop, you know, not only for getting all of these products and services that you're talking about, but also for selling your harvest. And so there's a lot of data associated with all of that. Do you ever get questions or concerns from growers about, well, hold on, you kind of have all this data about me. What are you going to do with it? And how do I know that it's not going to be used sort of against me? Well, the big thing is, is you don't bring this to a grower that you don't have a good relationship with. They always say the hardest thing to sell is seed because it's 100% relationship driven. If they're out there and they're purchasing seed from us, those are typically the growers that we're flying the drone with and the ones that are using Agelum anyway because that, that relationship's already built. So yes, I've sat at some kitchen tables or here in my office and been asked that question, where does this data go? And the big thing I tell them is anything that gets put into a gel stays within CHS. You know, we do not sell data anywhere, you know, and we have the same conversations with the climate people and, and that whole thing, but it's all about relationship. I think if they trust me, they're comfortable with me having that stuff. I'm not going to go cold call on a grower today and try to sell him some fertilizer and a bag of seed and then ask him to give me all my data. They will chase me off the farm with pitchforks. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> Understandable. Right. Well, I asked you some variation of this question earlier, but maybe let me ask this one, which is 
where do you see opportunities for even more advancement in in how you serve growers in in your capacity? I think as we're getting the data, you know, the harvest data, all that stuff back to the grower, the seed technologies and the different herbicides that are involved with them, the tracking and how a farm is sprayed today is not going to be the same in five or 10 years, I don't think. There's a lot of pressure on that industry right now. Good, bad, or indifferent with all the different herbicides that we're spraying. And and I believe we're doing things the right way, but you know, politics play a big role in that. And I I think there's some ways that we could use some imagery, such as the drone or anything else, you know, to find weed issues in a field and maybe only spray that piece. Now there's a whole other door that's opened up with residuals and all that stuff for the rest of the farm. But I think that's going to be the next piece of agriculture that really becomes important here in the next five or 10 years is how do we look at the field and bring in the information of the weed issues and risks that the grower has? And how do we apply that herbicide in a safe manner and maybe a more effective manner? I would also say that there's a lot of information and there's a lot of talk in the country right now about carbon credits and all that, you know, how we soil sample, how we collect that sample how it's being processed, all that stuff are things that CHS is looking into today, trying to figure out how we help our growers at that next best thing. You know, can we manage a disease before the corn's planted? You know, what diseases are in the soil today? Can we read those so we can recommend a product that isn't susceptible to that disease? You know, those are all things that we're looking at today that I'm really excited to see what happens in the short term. It's going to take some time, but I think in the longer term, these herbicides are going to be a big way of how we handle that. Thanks very much to Matt Larson for taking the time to be on the show. There's just no substitute for getting that local perspective from someone interacting with farmers every day to hear what's really working and what's not working when it comes to ag technology. Really appreciate that, Matt. Thank you. Thanks as well to Field Agent by Centera for sponsoring this first episode in the Tech Enabled Advisor series. Go learn more about them at centera.com. That's S-E-N-T-E-R-A dot com. If you work for a company that sells technology to agronomists, ag retailers, and other advisors, and you think we might align on a potential future episode in this series, let me know. I'm at tim at aggrad.com. Reminder as well to take our listener survey, and there's a link for that in the show notes as well. Thanks for your time and your attention. I never take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation.